Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dean Talk. Today we have with us Dr. D H Rao, who is the Dean of C M R University School of Engineering. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, tell us something about uh, C M R University. How did it start? The C M R uh, University uh, before starting C M R University, uh, the Gnana Dhara Trust under the name of uh, C M R Chikka Muniya Paredi. Right. Uh, he was a great uh, philosopher and uh, philanthropist. Yeah. His intention was to reach education to the masses. Mm -hmm. So with that, they started uh, small schools in a very small, humble way. And then it grew on. Over a period of time, they started lots of uh, schools. Right. And then uh, CMR Institute of Technology, one of the well-known uh, engineering colleges in the uh, state of uh, Karnataka. And then the CMR University mm -hmm. uh, started about uh, four years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, the School of Engineering and Technology under CMR University started uh, last year, that is uh, okay. 2016. Okay. Uh, that's how the, the journey of uh, CMR University uh, started. Okay, so uh, what are the different courses offered in School of Engineering? Here at uh, the SOET campus, that is School of Engineering Technology campus, mm -hmm. we offer uh, four uh, uh, courses, programs. One is in uh, Electronics and uh, Communication Engineering, other uh, Computer Science and Engineering, and uh, Information Technology and Mechanical Engineering. These are the four courses that we offer. Okay. So, uh, tell us something about the students here, sir. How, uh, how many students are here and how do they respond to the current system? Yes, uh, we have about uh, 150 students right now, it started, uh, since started last year. And the uh, students have been responding very well. And we have very good, uh, very talented uh, students, I should say. Right. So, academically may not be very good uh, when, uh, when they entered, but uh, certainly they are very talented. And uh, we're very sure that we can uh, articulate them and we take them, you know, to become very good uh, global engineers over right. a period of time. Right. Yes. So, talking about uh, taking them globally, so uh, what are the different methods of teaching adapted in uh, CMR University? Because uh, a lot of uh, uh, traditional methods are, are going away these days. So, what are the different methods? Are you using technology? in terms of learning or how is it done? Yes, uh, one of the basic uh, models which is uh, models that we are using right mm. now, what do you call it as outcome based uh, education. Right. So far like you know we have been teaching courses right, since my college days without really knowing as to why we are teaching this particular course. Mm. Even the faculty may not be knowing it, even the students may not know as to why a particular course is being taught. Right. We teach it because it is there in the curriculum. But uh, the, the, the professor has to know as to why he is teaching this course and the student should be known, should be made known a priori in advance what is the advantage of this particular course, what is the efficacy, mm. or the significance, the importance of learning a particular course. Right. I teach say physics for example, yeah. why I am teaching physics for these students, what is the outcome of this. So therefore, we keep the outcome in mind, it means keep the end in the beginning itself. Right, the students right. should be made known hey, after completing this course of th four months or five months or whatever. These are the skills that students should get. Yeah. Okay. So keeping that in mind, uh, we need to articulate our uh, program structure, mm. the syllabus, and that's not exactly what you are doing at a CMR University. Okay. It is completely okay. outcome-based education. Mm -hmm. Every course before we teach, right. the faculty will be told about this. What is outcome-based education? Uh -huh. And then the the professors have to discuss with the students right in advance the first class itself what is the importance of this course okay. these are the skills okay. that you will get after right. completing the course okay. therefore here the, the faculty would know even the students should know mm -hmm. each chapter wise you go through the this uh, the uh, this exercise okay. of making the professors known about it know about it and even the, the students also right. this is what you call as outcome based uh, education mm -hmm. so this is the uh, most unique part of cmr university Further, like you know, uh, the further to that, right? Uh, so we have been teaching. In a, see, in all the university educations, we have mass education, uh, equity, and excellence. Right. The excellence uh, is one part where, like, we have IITs and IAS and all that, where cream of the students go to those institutions. Where our universities, like, you know, CMR university or any other university, it's the equity, right? Students come from like from 40 percent to 90 uh, percent right. percentage. Right. So when I this equity education, the mass education. So, in this type of education, it is very difficult to articulate the talent of the students. We cannot really understand that the ability, the intellectual ability of each and every student. Yeah, yeah. So at CMR, 
right? Mm. We are trying to come up with a different model. We already started okay. now, uh -huh. right? Uh, what do you call it as uh, Bloom's uh, taxonomy? Okay. Say that defines the different levels. There are six levels of intellectual uh, mm. ability in every person, mm. right? right? So now the lowest level is the rote learning. What do you call? You yeah. all, all of us have gone through that. Yeah. Simple asking very simple questions about the definition and all that. Uh -huh. Then go to the next level of understanding, application, orientation, then evaluation, and so on. So our our question papers or internal tests, mm -hmm. they're also articulated. They're also based on what is called as the Bloom's taxonomy. Okay. Okay. Further, in, what is the efficacy? What is the importance of this? Is that when you evaluate the students' uh, answer books, yeah. so every student can be horizontal. If you see, mm -hmm. right, uh, the a student answering in physics, chemistry, electronics, or whatever this, the the subjects we have, we can find out the level of the student, whether okay. is at the lowest level or is at the second level. Right. right, or at the third right. level. And in each question paper, we formulate our questions in such a way mm. that the, it covers about two, three levels, L1 level, L2 level, and L3 level. Right. So the, depending on the, the students who have answered the L1 level or L2 level, we can uh, find out, we can determine right, the, the, the intellectual ability of the students. Uh, what are these levels, L1, L2? See, the L1 level is basically the lowest level. That is just uh, remembering, by hearting. Mm. Uh -huh. Just by hard, uh, rote learning, what mm -hmm. you call. Just ask a very simple question like, you know, define uh, voltage or define power or whatever. Mm -hmm. Without understanding that, you know, the, the, the content of it, the student just by, by hurting, right. he can just come and write. Yeah. Many of our uh, so-called, like, you know, the education system so far, by and large has been focused on this. Exactly. Just That's define. That's very true. Yeah. Right? Therefore, without really understanding it, the students will come and write. If he has a very good memory, mm -hmm. You will just reproduce what is there in the textbook. Yeah. Memory power is tested. His more memory than power the is skills. tested more yeah. than his skills or her exactly. skills. So here we also give importance to it because uh, the students may come from that uh, also. Therefore, we have L1 level, L2 level. Mm -hmm. L2 level is the understanding level. Mm -hmm. Using this concept, you can solve some problem. Right. L3 level is a little, little higher. Application. Application, based. exactly. Yeah. The application part of it. Mm -hmm. Can you use this somewhere like you know, in day to day, uh, the tools, the gadgets that you use? Mm -hmm. So we try to evaluate the students' uh, intellectual ability right. without explicitly telling them. Uh -huh. Because I will not tell the students, okay, this is at L3 level or L2 level. Huh. So that may put certain unnecessary pressure onto the students. So, so this is how we, uh, we do that. And once the, the results are tabulated, right, uh, horizontally you can see that the, the each student level you can calculate. This student is at L2 level. Okay, so I can give them, give him or her a little more support mm -hmm. so that he or she can go to the L3 level in the next semester. Absolutely. This is what you called as a Bloom's taxonomy and we've already implemented in uh, our uh, CMR University. Okay, that's brilliant, sir. That is, that is really amazing because that's something that's required in today's education system, I feel. Right. right. <laughs> Further, uh, further to that, uh, we also, you know, focusing more on the experiential learning, mm -hmm. right? It is not just a theory, theory uh, being taught, you know, in the classroom. Oh, we are the, the more emphasis on the practical part of it. See, we did, uh, at least in my experience of nearly 40 years in the teaching profession, uh, I did find that some students are very good in theoretical concepts. Mm. And uh, some students are very good in practical, practical part of it. Aspect. We treat them equally. Right now, uh, there is no difference of, uh, in, our in our teaching mechanism, there is no way that we can find out the students are good theoretically or the students are good in practicals. Wow. <laughs> so if I find one cohort of students are good in practicals, uh -huh. okay, I'll give them more exercise on, on the practicals, let him, uh, uh, that skill that be, skill. you know, yeah. be enhanced. Yeah. And the students are good theoretically, okay, let them go in this, uh, maybe research or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they are, these people can become real engineers. <laughs> These people may become, you know, uh, researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow they may get into a PhD or whatever. Okay, okay, that's super. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about the curriculum. Uh, how is the curriculum in CMI University different from other universities and other institutions out there? Oh, certainly it is one of the signature uh, points of our university. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been the tradition that, uh, you know, first year be made common, mm -hmm. right? And whether it's uh, the student takes electronics or computer science or mechanical. Some of it has come from the, you know, since my days, yeah. okay, some 40, 50 years, it has been the tradition. Mm -hmm. So wow. I always uh, question uh, as to why you should teach this uh, subject. Say for example, uh, computer science students uh, studying say civil engineering, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. When a computer science graduate goes for an interview tomorrow, we won't expect uh, the interviewer to ask questions on civil engineering right. because <laughs> it's basically a computer science engineer, yeah. right? There is no point in teaching that 
course right to the students they, which they are not interested in yeah right so yeah, therefore yeah, absolutely. Uh, right from the first year what we are trying to do what, what we have done already in uh, CMR University right from the first year itself based on the branch mm -hmm. right we put those subjects for, uh, for oh, example uh, electronic students they study electronics some oh, of them are common brilliant. though like yeah. uh, mathematics physics and all that they are common <laughs> But instead of uh, studying other subjects like mechanical or civil engineering, I try to introduce uh, electronic subjects right. for right. electronic students, right. computer science uh, programming or whatever for right. computer science students more, mechanical students maybe mechanical drawing or whatever. Okay. So we are making branch specific uh, courses, oh. uh, syllabus right from the, the first year itself. Mm -hmm. So they, they, their, their skills get uh, enhanced. And there is a continuity of uh, subjects. Exactly. When I teach uh, some subject in the first semester, it's continuity in the second, in the third, and so on. So more topics can be covered. More advanced topics can be covered at the uh, at the BTEC level itself. Yeah, That's because all. I remember when I was in my engineering, I I used to wonder why am I studying so many subjects which is not relevant to my branch. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> many students go through that. Yeah. And one of the other uh, interesting points that I did, I did observe. Right, you know, the, so mechanic, when you take a feedback from the students about the faculty, mm -hmm. right, so one of the uh, professors, uh, maybe he teaching uh, civil, huh, huh, uh, okay. gets a very good rating in one class huh, and very okay. less rating, you know, in another class. Right. I was just okay. trying to evaluate as to why it happens. The teacher remains the same, <laughs> right, you know, the way I teach remains yeah. the same. So we did find that the students of electronics who are not interested in civil engineering, mm -hmm. They give you less grading. <laughs> Students of civil engineering give you a better grade, right, right in the field yeah. because they're interested in that. Exactly. So therefore, making the students unnecessarily study, mm. right, uh, the subjects they are not interested in. So you choose a particular branch of engineering because you like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so give more skills, more, more knowledge exactly. into that. So you know they become uh, better. Uh, you know uh, they gain more domain and knowledge. Right. That's okay. brilliant, sir. That's really something unique, and that's something that's needed in the education system these days instead of just studying everything that's out there yes just focusing on one thing that's that's good so what are the different knowledge gaps that you have observed in the students these days is it um, i mean it's this is it the same as it was a few years ago or uh, has it been any different and what makes the students here globally acceptable being oh, globally acceptable. Yeah, very nice. Like, you know, we do see a lot of uh, knowledge gaps these days mm. because the, the dynamics or the changes in the, uh, uh, the technology right, is right. changing so fast that I cannot keep uh, the syllabus of uh, last, uh, you know, few years mm. of uh, decades uh, relevant. So we're trying to make the, uh, we're trying to mitigate the gap, the knowledge gap mm. by putting, you know, the, the recent courses. Say, for example, we talk about IoT, Internet of Things yes, and stuff yes. like that, right, cloud computing. Mm. There are so many, uh, you know, in our electronics, the VLSI, yeah. uh, robotics, yeah. for example, yeah. artificial intelligence being used everywhere. Yeah. So these are the topics that we always kept as electives or not in the BTEC program, mm. you know, away from that. So we're trying to inculcate those things yeah. here to mitigate the gap, the knowledge gap, what is the students uh, learn in our uh, colleges mm. and what does the industry want outside. Exactly. See, the, the future jobs, Right, the future jobs will not be those of the jobs of today or yesterday. Exactly. Right, yeah. the future jobs will be of a different nature. You have to be very skilled, right, in, a, in your domain area. Yeah. Right, and we need to identify those knowledge gaps exactly. and fill it up. We will not be able to fill it up to the 100% right. because the industry dynamics keep changing very mm. fast. But nevertheless, in our university where we have the academic autonomy, I can change the syllabus the next semester itself or the next year itself. That's like predictive that's awesome. analysis, mm -hmm. many of the things that are being used in uh, computer science area, mm -hmm. electronics, or even in mechanical. So we have 3D printing, laser yeah, cutting. Yeah. We all right. talk about the technology only in the newspapers or in the <laughs> advanced journals. So now we are trying to put yeah. it here, right mm -hmm. in our, uh, you know, uh, CM or university, and see that to the knowledge gap that is existing now mm -hmm. between the uh, the graduates uh, graduating and from the, the portals of yeah. our institute and, the, and what the industry, industry needs, yeah. trying to mitigate that gap. Exactly, because uh, even a couple of years ago, uh, startups were new. Now, India has become the hub of startups. startups. And uh, knowing just C, C++ and Java that we learn in engineering is, it's not much of use because we need to apply it in maybe Android, uh, iOS, IoT. IoT. There right. is a lot that's 
uh, that the industry needs these days. Yes, and that is the uh, the reason. Particularly in uh, maybe a few years ago, mm. uh, you would be hired. The students would be hired at the placement, yeah. and they would go through what is called as a, a training period or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Now the industries do not have so much time. Exactly. They have to invest so much money and time on yeah. you, right, to train them. Yeah. Right. Instead, the the industries do need. Right, the students are the skilled, skilled by the time they graduate mm -hmm. from the portals of our institution. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that is the one that we are trying to focus here on that. Exactly. It is not just not only the domain knowledge, even the soft skills required for that. As you are rightly mentioning the global perspective. Mm -hmm. See, when I went abroad in way back in 1987, right, uh, I, we were found wanting. Maybe technically good, but uh, the other skills required to be a successful uh, you know, a researcher or a professional, certainly we were found wanting. Yeah. Right, particularly writing skills, mm. right, you know, speaking abilities. Those skills are very necessary. Exactly. Like the, the domain knowledge is one certainly one aspect where the students but have to... But that's not the only thing that's, that's the only required, thing. yeah. And the soft skills have to be uh, uh, inculcated or trained yeah. or given to the students right from the, you know, in engineering first mm. year or second year onwards. So that becomes a very important uh, point to make them globally acceptable. Exactly. And one another very important aspect that we see when very rightly said about the global uh, professionals or global engineers, right, is uh, the cultural sensitivity. Yeah. Right. That is a very, very, uh, you know, important topic right. that normally gets ignored in our technological right. universities or engineering institutions. Yeah. Yeah. We normally bother about domain knowledge, technical knowledge. That's what, all. Okay, this That's is very important. <laughs> but the soft skills is another aspect. Mm -hmm. But the cultural sensitivity, you know, gender sensitivity. The students going out, they do not understand, right, what mistakes are they doing. Yeah. yeah. Right? They, they, they come to know after doing a mistake. They learn by doing mistakes, but by the time uh, enough damage would have been done to them. Right. So, inculcate that uh, into them here itself. Mm -hmm. A cultural sensitivity is a very important, crucial factor. Okay. Right? Because now the world is flat. Exactly. You are good, you'll excel anywhere in the world. Yeah. Right? Gone are those days when the students are graduating from, say, a place like Bangalore or Chennai or Hyderabad or whatever. But now those days are gone. Yeah. You are good, you will survive anywhere in the world. Exactly. Only this, keep this in mind that you know, have a good domain knowledge, soft skills, cultural yeah. sensitivity. And the summit of all Grow that is a good attitude. Yeah. So, like I mentioned, the traditional methods of teaching are losing its scope these days. So, uh, is technology used in terms of uh, teaching and learning and gaining knowledge in CMI University? The traditional teaching assets cannot be taken away. Yeah. Like, you know, blackboard, uh, chalk and uh, board uh, concept has to be there. Right. Because everything, I cannot just use a PPT or whatever and mm -hmm. uh, teach them. So the, in uh, certain situations, I need to teach on the blackboard mm -hmm. and make the students work along with me. Yeah. So, you know, they understand the concepts mm -hmm. better. Having said that, the technology is so ubiquitous, it's very everywhere, it exists everywhere, yeah, right? Yeah. If I don't uh, use it myself, I become as obsolete as a professor, mm -hmm. right? If I don't expose that to the students, right. the students are not well exposed, number one. Number two, right, there are so many, like for example, animations available, videos are available, right? Make online the, education online has education, become very prevalent. Very, very prevalent. And it's very imperative on our part to make sure the students also are aware of these uh, changes are taking place. Mm -hmm. Not only the exposure to the students, but also make the students aware of the concept that I am teaching. Mm -hmm. I can reinforce, right, you know, my, the concept of uh, whatever I am teaching. Mm -hmm. With not only on the blackboard, uh, chalk and blackboard yeah. teaching, yeah. it can be uh, complemented or supplemented with the videos that I can show it, yeah. which are available, yeah. right, on the internet and everywhere it is available. Yeah. The students, see, they are in, in a class of 60 or whatever, there are different sections of the students. Yeah. Some students may understand with the blackboard teaching. Mm -hmm. Some students may, maybe they are more of visual in nature, yeah. where they can understand looking at it. Yeah. Therefore, when you want to cover all the students there, use both the methods, conventional teaching, right, complemented with or supplemented with, mm -hmm. right, you know, these uh, videos, animations, mm -hmm. right, to make their concepts more uh, clear. Okay. So, uh, coming to examination patterns, is there any different examination pattern adapted by C, uh, CMR University? Because it's usually like most of the weightage is given to the final examination where uh, students just, you know, mug up the textbooks and write the answers the next day. So is there anything different adapted in this university here? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know, we're trying to do, uh, give equal weightage, right, you know, to the continuous evaluation. As you very rightly said, 
the students under pressure mm -hmm. right you know give uh, when they go for three hour test yeah. you teach them for one semester four months mm -hmm. and trying to evaluate or assess their knowledge but in the three hour test exactly. right three hour uh, duration of examination maybe on that day right in the student is not well or is sick or is not able to remember what all he has studied mm -hmm. for whatever may be the reason it doesn't mean that the student is bad so just the evaluating a student on the basis of the academic performance or in this three hour test mm -hmm. cert certainly will not uh, demonstrate or not is not a pointer to the student's ability yeah the yeah. student's abilities are can be evaluated properly when they are not under stress right exactly. there has to be uh, continuous and comprehensive evaluation mm -hmm. continuous right i conduct a test conduct a laboratory test let's see how are they doing it Therefore, in our CMR university, we are trying to make it 50-50, right? 50 percent for the uh, you know continuous evaluation, and 50 percent for the examination. Yeah, yeah. And also, we are trying to modulate it, uh, change it again, right? Uh, we always ask a question as to why a three-hour test? Yeah. Where did it come from? Why the three-hour exactly. test? Who defined it three? Right? You really don't know. So, we're just trying to find out whether whether we should really stick on to this, or can I give some you know coming up with some uh, disruptive uh, concept of uh, take home exam it's already there in america other yeah, universities yeah. i'll give a take home exam yeah. okay you come up with your own solution yeah only to do this uh, why you uh, you know the the only the, the thing that obscures us in doing it is yeah. right the society at large has to be matured enough the parents have exactly. to understand yeah okay the student the parents should not think that we give the exam to the, the students at home <laughs> and they'll copy something and come no, the open-end exams are more difficult than yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. It's about the application of the knowledge right. that has been gained and not just... So, therefore, that we are trying to implement a little mm -hmm. later. And also, right, you know, the, in the examination uh, pattern, as I just uh, told you, right, let us change, right, not to ask only the rote learning or the lowest level. Mm -hmm. Let us see the, whether the students can be evaluated at whatever their, their level at, their, their right. at. So, therefore, this gives, right, you know, the students the confidence, yeah, yeah. right, where are, even for us also, where I can take my students up, mm -hmm. to what level I can take them. So, the examination system should not be just a, a marks giving or marks taking. Yeah, it should be yeah. a proper assessment. Assessment of the students has to take place. Yeah. That's what we are trying to do it at, uh, uh, you know, CMR University. It is not, just not the evaluation, yeah. but the assessment also as well. Exactly. That's brilliant, sir. That's, mm -hmm. that's really good. So, uh, like I mentioned, online education is booming these days, and uh, you know everything is available in the tip on the tip of their fingers. Anybody, or students can sit at home or anywhere yes. and sure. learn from anywhere. So, uh, basically, that uh, the convention is that online education gives individual attention. So, how is individual attention given here in this university, in spite of being this being a classroom education? True, like. Uh Everything you get on the internet, yeah. what are the notes that I have or whatever is syllabus, mm -hmm. everything is available on the internet. So here the role of the teachers is slightly different. Yeah. Therefore here at, uh, at our CMR University, we are trying to have a paradigm shift from the teacher centric education to student centric education. Mm -hmm. A teacher centric is always more of a passive teaching, I yeah. teach and you listen, yeah. right? So here in the student centric education where the students also become you know, responsible for their own learning yeah. and also you should become more of uh, active uh, learning okay. and uh, how do you make it? Right, you know, it's basically in uh, more of a practical exposures mm -hmm. to them, experiential mm -hmm. learning, mm -hmm. take them out of the classroom, yeah. give them some, we did a, you know, build a thon exercise just a couple of months <laughs> ago. Uh, we give them some small tools and come up with their own models, uh, just wonderful. And they have such innovative ideas uh, into them, only we give them a platform. So here yeah. uh, the teachers should be more of a facilitators of knowledge uh, transformation. Exactly. It is not just uh, knowledge available in the book today. Just <laughs> because I'm born early, I read it early. Maybe <laughs> tomorrow you'll read it. Uh, so it should not be just uh, uh, knowledge, uh, information transfer from the textbook to the students. Yeah. Yeah. We, now the role of teachers is different now. Mm. Particularly in trying to say in, uh, in our training mm. of our faculty, I keep mentioning that. We are more of facilitators. Yeah. Right, we should become more facilitators of knowledge transfer to the students. Than just teachers. Than, because now the students are more uh, adept in using all these uh -huh. electronic gadgets, right, they can get much faster than yeah. we people. But we should make them understand, right, you know, we are knowledge facilitators, how that knowledge can be used mm -hmm. in problem solving. Right. Our main focus is on problem solving, mm -hmm. right, okay, I give a, give a problem to you, how do you approach the problem? Exactly. Okay. That is yeah. a focus that we are trying to do at uh, CMR University. That's brilliant, sir. So, uh, so going forward, what are the different strategies uh, that are in place 
in terms of growth of the university? See, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, like, you know, the main focus at uh, CMR University is more of uh, practical training, experiential learning. Mm -hmm. So in that process, we have what is called as a maker's space, yeah. okay, where the, even the faculty or the students mm -hmm. may get an idea. Okay. Right. So in addition to their academic, uh, you know, the exercise they need to do to get their degree, beyond that, even at the first year level or second year level, uh, irrespective of what uh, uh, semester they are studying in, mm -hmm. if the students have an idea, they should have some laboratory where they can go and try their experiments. Right, right. So we have very well structured, uh, you know, a maker space concept. Uh -huh. It's all available in our CMR, I think. Okay. Where we have, and we are providing all the, uh, you know, the necessary equipment. Mm -hmm. For example, 3D printer, mm -hmm. laser cutter, mm -hmm. all the machines are being installed now. That's where students can go and try their ideas. Uh -huh. It works, fine, you can take it further. It mm -hmm. doesn't work, we learn better, like to know that why it didn't work. Right. Where the, what are the changes that we have to make? Mm -hmm. So very systematized approach, mm -hmm. right? Is uh, is exposed to is given to the students okay. to try out their uh, ideas. Even the faculty uh -huh. also can come and do it because uh, buying a 3D printer, laser printer at an individual level is just impossible. Uh -huh. So we right. facilitate that, right? You know, to uh, to unleash the uh, the creativity and innovative minds of the students uh, and the faculty. Right. Right. The basic uh, here, the bottom line is to foster that research activity onto the into the students okay. not really taking to the big labs of research or whatever mm -hmm. the research can start even at the lowest level right. you know the, the regular experiments you conduct in our laboratories mm -hmm. even a small variation in that experiment what the results are likely to get right yeah. why is it coming yeah. right why is it not coming the yeah. students should be able to get that analytical mind right. that leads to further research and all that okay. that is a focus that we want to make it here at uh, CMR University okay that's brilliant sir so finally, do you have any word to parents and students who are attending Times University? Yes, uh, particularly to the to the uh, parents, uh -huh. right? Don't force them, right? To take <laughs> one particular branch just because he or she like the mother or father likes one particular branch or whatever. Just because the father has a mechanical industry, right. uh, please don't force your children to go into mechanical engineering, <laughs> or just don't go by the reports that uh, the the software engineers are being. Uh, you know, fired and all that, yeah. right, by the news uh, media and all that. But if this, the child is interested in a particular branch, mm -hmm. let them study. Let them follow their uh, passion. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they will be the successful because the passion has to be there for the students. Mm -hmm. And with that, certainly they will be successful in the, you know, in the years to come. Very true. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So, uh, thank you so much for being with us. It was great having you here. It was a pleasure talking to you and getting to know about CMR University. Thank you all. Thank you very much. All right, viewers. So, that's a wrap of this episode of Dean Talk. I'll see you in the next episode. Till then, stay tuned. Keep watching YTV. It's your channel.